Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Right. Well, good morning. And I do thank you all for coming out so early on Saturday morning. And it's my pleasure to be here. Um, you know, like he said, I learned from my grandfather, my, my dad. Um, my grandfather bought the business from Conrad Schmidt back uh, in 1956. He started working there when he was uh, right out of college. Um, he went to, his, his parents wouldn't let him do art, so he had to walk to Corcoran Art School in D.C. or Philly, I believe, D.C., Philly. And um, then he uh, ended up doing portraits on the way back. That's how he got home, went and painted the insides of ship's hulls and eventually bought the business from Conrad Schmidt. Um, but the, this is about brother Adrian Weaver and it's, I'm trying to draw a parallel between Conrad Schmidt and Brother Adrian. Um, Brother Adrian, I, th I think he died in 1914, if I'm correct. He, my grandfather was born in 1913, so I'm saying, okay, Brother Adrian stopped, Grandpa started. Um, Conrad Schmidt was founded in 1889, so we're celebrating our 125th this year. And I'm guessing that we were competitors at the time or even co, you know, working together. We, we can't find any files that date back any further than 1910 or so, 1915, because we had a fire in our company. But, you know, back around the turn of the century is when everybody was uh, immigrating to the United States. And I'm, I'm not going to spend too much on Brother Adrian because I know that uh, the Professor Harmon is going to be giving a presentation on that later. But, uh, you know, many Germans coming. I'm, I'm not German, I'm just Bernard Gunnar Grunke from Conrad Schmidt in New Berlin, Wisconsin. But, <laughs> but uh, we know that uh, Brother Adrian was responsible for, you know, over a hundred churches that he designed, built, um, probably uh, had a major role, I don't know, I, probably is not the word, had a major role in the artworks, the murals, the stained glass, and everything. You can see here they're, they're uh, building the St. Uh, Anthony Seminary in Santa Barbara. They were using, you know, hand shovels. And the thing I'm trying to get at is, is that he, he did a hundred churches in his lifetime, and there were no backhoes. There were no computers. There were, you know, I mean, everything, there, there, there weren't even cars. So how this is, this man's amazing. I mean, what he did, it, it's just, it's beyond, um, you know, cause I'll probably, if I do a hundred churches in restoration, which we have a whole crew of 55 artists that work for us and we have, um, you know, designers and rendering artists and, and everything, but how do you, how do you do a hundred churches in your lifetime, you know, back then? That, that just shocks me. This is actually a church in Milwaukee, St. Josephat's Basilica. And this is the post office from Chicago, which in the early uh, 1900s, they took the post office apart in Chicago, put it on uh, the, the wagons and brought it up piece by piece, hand dug. I was told that the women had their aprons and they would hold their aprons and the men would shovel the dirt in probably the exact same way at the exact same time that Brother Weaver was doing it. It, it's interesting that I saw that uh, part of this uh, Brother Adrian presentation is called Build My Church, and I gave a presentation a couple years ago at St. Meinrad's Arch Abbey, and this was the name of our, our presentation, and, and uh, you know, right out of the Bible. So it was a um, nice connection. I think everybody should be familiar with St. Meinrad. I mean, Brother Adrian did some of the most beautiful churches in this uh, in this country, uh, predominantly the Midwest, but I, I think that uh, St. Meinrad, uh, the exterior um, architecture is just phenomenal. Uh, founded in 1854, uh, completed in 1907, and we've gone through the hundred projects or so that, that are listed as completed by Brother Adrian and we found that we've worked on a lot of those buildings, you know, just, just not including pre-1912 um, projects. But if you can see the, by the architecture, this is a phenomenal building. Have you all been there? Everybody seen it? 
it's like it's like our holy hill up in Wisconsin. We have uh, a holy hill up there, but this is really something. I know you guys will go to Sacred Heart this evening, and uh, I don't know, is Michael Egan in here? Hi, Mike. <laughs> He's going to be giving a presentation on that later, so we're not going to touch base on that too much. This is Conrad, our founder. Uh, I'm very German, came from Bavaria. I, I think that is close to where uh, Adrian came from, Brother Adrian. Cl not close? <laughs> I thought I saw something like that. This is a great shot. This is the artists back in the, in the old shop in the early 1900s, and you know, they got to have their big keg of triple X beer, you know, of course, and <laughs> cigars, and you know, they're all wearing suits in almost all these pictures that we have, bow ties. I mean, this is a little different than the way they are today. This is a neat, uh, neat photo. We found this in a newspaper from 1923. It's the company Picnic and the company truck. Back then it said that we did interior decorations and uh, furniture and drapery. We also did a lot of lighting at the time, uh, but the, the scope of the, the company's, uh, br the breadth of our services has continued to change. You can see, you know, there Conrad there and, and his brother here and you know, there were three of them at the time. But this ends up being from Nagawaki Park in Wisconsin. And I ended up living in Nagawaki Park subdivision when we found this article. So it kind of a neat connection. In 1933, Conrad Schmidt worked with Ganipo Raji to, uh, well, we actually worked a little earlier with Ganipo Raji uh, on the paintings at, um, the Basilica in Milwaukee. But this is the restoration of some of the Luigi Gregori murals in 1933 at Notre Dame. So we've been working with Notre Dame since 1933 and we're still working there today. We, we, a proposal went in last week for uh, one of the halls. We, we put stained glass windows in all of the new chapels that they build. Um, there's a chapel in every new resident hall. This is the basilica that I showed you that was actually taken down uh, the post office in, in uh, Chicago. The doorknobs still have the little eagles on them. Uh, the original interior. Very plain. A, a, a lot of times what they do is, is they, don't, they, they don't have the money to decorate the church. I mean, it's still happening today when... when uh, Architects are building the, the great churches. There's a number of architects now that have switched and gone back to building traditional churches. And um, they're still not getting the level of decoration that they could because when you're at your $12 million point, how can you spend the extra million and a half to do the decorating? And I'm not saying every church is a million and a half, but these are big churches now. Um, they're building them because they all grew their last church. So they, they didn't decorate it. And you'll see later of an image of where Conrad Schmidt went in and did all the faux, all the faux marble on the columns, the gold leaf. I, I believe more of it was actually aluminum leaf with Nicholas lacquers. And I'm not, I'm not getting into too much detail, but if you guys have any questions about anything, please, please ask. It's interesting, we, we, we were able to find these old ads, correct liturgical decorating, it's all the same things from 1910, 1920. This one on the left is 1921 or 28, I believe. But we were, we were doing the same things. Here's Louisville, Kentucky on the right, St. James. Um, we just have a different address now. Yeah, old masters in new lights with whom may the responsibility be entrusted, 1930. The economy of craftsmanship, I can't believe we were, back then we were, we were already fighting about, we're more, we find so many letters in the files that, you know, you're too expensive, you're more, you're more than this guy. It's like, I'm getting the same letters today. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we're doing a different, a different service, you know. It's how to convince that. And this is funny, 1930, new beauty for older churches. So uh, we've been around for a while doing this and, and it, uh, it's the same thing today as it was back then, it's just a little bit different time. 
This is 1933 where we were recreating the glory of Sacred Heart Church at Notre Dame. And now we, we gild their dome every 20 years, put the new gold on there. I forgot this was Baltimore, Maryland. So what we did in the 1900s to decorate churches in 1889, and so we did renderings. So the, the architect would give us some drawings of what he's going to do. Maybe it was Brother We Were. And we would do a watercolor rendering to show what it's going to look like. We found over 500 of these historic renderings in our attic a couple years ago. We've actually got these uh, on tour. They, they go on exhibit, and um, we've done two tours so far. But we have only framed, I'd say, 80 of them. So, so we have these. Every single one is a fine work of art. You know, I mean, and I don't know how to grow that interest. The, 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 the challenge is, is that most of them don't have names. I'd like to start a website somehow that says, identify this church, please. You know, what, what is, where is this church? I need your help. So, because the church should have those renderings. Um, went from Conrad, and then my grandpa joined here, here. A lot better looking than his grandson. But, <laughs> so, yeah, our, our old studio here. And I, I know you've all gotten a book, so you'll, you'll see the new studio in there and what have you. But grandpa joined, and, and he brought my, my dad into the business here, 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 my, my dad and, and my sister down here. And, you know, when I was eight years old, I was applying gold at the Paps Theater lobby in Milwaukee to the ceiling. So, so <laughs> how do you know how, how to do gold leaf? It was just, it was like riding a bike. You know, that's what we did. So that's the new shop. Uh, that's actually the Paps Theater right there in 1976 where we did the, uh, the gold leaf. My dad, Bernie Grinky Jr., I'm actually Bernie the uh, Third. he and Grandpa made the first faceted glass window in this country in my Grandpa's garage, and it's in the studio, it's uh, Christ on a Rainbow, and it, uh, Grandpa went to Europe and brought back all the dolls, dolls, doll de verre, from Europe, and it was the new thing over there, and so he made it in the garage with concrete mix and, and my dad's marbles in the stars. So these are some of the Brother Adrian projects that we worked on, but not while he was there. So we don't know, I don't know if he didn't finish it and we did the decorating or if we restored his decorating. I, I'm not that deep into these files yet because there's a lot of them, uh, not just these five, but, um, but we've done the stained glass at St. Meinrad in the chapel. Uh, obviously Sacred Heart here in 2005, St. Augustine's. So here's some of the things that we found in our files, and I'm hoping that, you know, as this um, Brother Adrian Centennial is, is coming, coming to fruition here, that we can start to share these. We didn't know that, that um, Brother Adrian was such a magnificent architect and, and, and involved in so much, and then when we start getting into our files, we have a lot to share. You know, there's, there, there's a lot of good stuff here. I mean, these are renderings that we did um, and then some photos that we found. St. Augustine in Chicago. I don't know. These must be negatives that... Immaculate Conception in Alton, Illinois. You know, that one we know the, the rendering that goes with it. St. Meinrad, just some of the parts that we found from our file. We're not going to, I'm just going to go through the next five slides very quickly, but it's, we've got 1931, 1927, 1930, all these different projects that we've done. St. Boniface in San Francisco in 1936, 37, 30, 36. And some of them were just letters that said, you lost the job. 
but some, <laughs> some, <laughs> some of them were, you know, but we still have the, the historic information in the files, which is nice. <coughs> It's very common that when we get a phone call, I, I received a phone call from Johann von Petri up at uh, St. Uh, Mary's Basilica in Minneapolis last week or two weeks ago. And he said he's got a church in Williamsburg, Iowa that he would like me to come take a look at. Went in the archives, sure, we did work there back in 1924 or something like that. So we're, it's, it's really a nice set of archives that we have. And they go on. Immaculate Conception in Alton, all of the different projects there. Sacred Heart. We did the decorative painting, replicated the stained glass windows that were damaged. Um, oops, it says there's an entire file drawer dedicated to Sacred Heart's restoration, including two binders of photographs and documentation of the decorative artwork. So I was at a church in Ohio, uh, Glandorf, Ohio. We restored it back in 19. 90 after a fire and I when I was preparing for this presentation I thought that's got to be a brother Adrian we were um, church but no it was a cuddle and Richardson out of um, Cleveland and here's two guys that were around during that same period of time 1944 to 1916 but they've only got a list of 10 churches <laughs> so I don't know how Brother Adrian we were, uh, Weaver could do that with, with himself. I don't know if he had a team or, or what, but he must have had an incredible team. So I'm going to show what happens today um, in, in order to decorate a church or a cathedral or a chapel. So what we do is we do the rendering. Now it's, it's uh, we took the... We took the uh, the drawing that, in this case, Frank and Lozen did, um, Art Lozen and uh, Michael Frank, and we developed some designs. Took it back and, oh, there was a budget cut. <laughs> yeah, so so, so that, that was the budget cut. Then we go and say, well, you know, let's change some of the colors and put some stained glass in there. Uh, a little more modest design. This is actually similar to the stencil that was chosen. We did that all on canvas at our shop. We did, I think it was a thousand feet of it, and we went and put it up there on lifts. You know, not not the best way for artists to be working. You can Michelangelo on a lift going down. You know, belt down <laughs> wouldn't work that way. But uh, different options. They really wanted the words going around the uh, perimeter. Options in gold leaf. Every single option is given a price. The gold leaf is given the additional cost of the gold. These were, what we did is, we just figured out how many characters it would take to fit each side of the church because we had to do this side, this side, this side, here, here, uh, here, here. So we, we gave them how many characters they need to find. Then Father went into the Latin Bible and, and found the exact words he wanted there, that the scripture that would fit. St. Louis Church in Memphis. So they had, at one point, someone, this beautiful marble back here, someone taped up plastic over it when they were doing some asbestos abatement or something like that, and they could never get the tape residue off, no matter what anybody tried. So they decided, okay, instead of building, this was going to become the gymnasium, but instead of building a six or nine million dollar church, they're going to spend a million and a half and really fix this one. So we started with the renderings. We said, yeah, you know, not my favorite, more, more uh, almost 70s, but then an architect got involved and said, we're going to put in a baldacchino and some side pieces and try to traditionalize this church. And then Father said, we want to build a giant light box behind the altar and put in a big stained glass window like Sacha Chapelle. And then there's a four foot walkway behind there. Um, and that's what ended up happening. It was a little more like this is the final product right here. 
Well, no, they did not that window. They chose to go with the standard window. But we did get the 12 apostles and carved statues, new carved uh, marble or uh, limestone from Indiana, I think, right around here. All of the stained glass designs. I would have liked this one, but that was rejected. Different ceiling panel options, statues, the drawings for the uh, Balbacino that was carved out of limestone. And here's a, another church in South Dakota, Salem, South Dakota. So I just want to show the, the few different options. I'm sorry. Um, you can see the different rendering options here. That, oops. So that's the before. And then this one is a project I just finished in St. Anthony, Minnesota, near Minneapolis. This is the before, and we did a number of different versions. We, we actually erected the scaffolding and painted and decorated the entire interior in 12 weeks. Wow. And, and this is marble from here to here. We don't have the finished photos yet. They're, they're not done with some of the other pieces. but. So this is marble from here to here, and this was wallpaper here and here. We actually had, we removed the wallpaper and then had a plaster float the, the walls and cut in grout lines, and we made that all full marble, and it, you will not be able to tell where the marble starts and where the full marble starts. The artist was amazing. I mean, these, th these guys, they, they do these murals in, in Weeks, you know, they they're, they're just so fast and good because. People you have doing this, I mean, in 12 weeks is pretty fast. On that project, I had, I think, at one point five or six. Yeah. It a, lot it, of a lot of scaffolding. <laughs> yeah, it was over 150 thousand in scaffolding. This is the before of uh, the cathedral in in um, Springfield, Illinois, and you can see the. Uh, the changes to the flooring and the font. And that's the finished shot. This is all tromploy up here on the ceiling, so that's all painted in. Oops, starts going by itself once more. 60, 70 feet in the air? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that might even, yeah, at least 70, I think. These are all scagliola columns. Scagliola is uh, a full marble. It's a plaster that's been manipulated with pigment. You'll see it down at French Lick. Um, in the in the uh, lobby of the hotel, um, there was so much gold used on the ceiling of this project. I think it was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of material in gold. That at that park, Nagawaki Park, where I showed you the company picnic, one of the the foreman on this project was chasing me around, and we're having our company party there two years ago or three years ago, or, and he's chasing me around. I'm trying to get the you know the beer set and the the corn roasted and everything, and he, I need to talk to you. I'm like, follow me to the car. So he's following me and talking to me, and he hands me an envelope, and it's cash, and it was $3,000. I said, what's this? He said, I picked up all the gold that fell off the, the ceiling onto the plastic that I saved and took it to a guy on the side of the road. I'm like, wow. So, well, he got a little, a little chunk of that, of course. Could you do the back or the before and after? That's the before. I, there was a new altar ordered from uh, uh, Italy. The, the columns, these, the, the skag columns were varnished, so we had to strip them. We had to, we had to scrub them and clean them and polish them and sand them and then tin oxide them. And then can, canuba, carnuba wax, uh, the ceiling was just dark and, and everything up here was just dark. And we went through an entire probably month of sampling, maybe two months of doing samples to show what it could look like. You know, this was just the rendering. Lighten it up there. Yeah. Not as light as that shows. Whoops. Yeah. And they have some unbelievable stained glass windows from Thomas O'Shaughnessy out of Chicago. This is St. Peter's in Omaha, and that's the before. You can see the ceiling was a uh, drop ceiling with all the old tiles, water damage. The columns are just plaster columns, plain columns. 
got sort of a 70s, 80s deco in there. You know, grandpa's little words that he artistically put on there. I don't know that my grandpa did them, but we did a lot of work like this. So then we said, well, let's see, how do, how do you like the red version? Well, how about, Father said, how about some blue stars and some, some murals? Well, we're getting closer. The Twelve Apostles. They're minor versions. They're mi minor variations, but they actually really, I mean, financially change the project and change the success of the visual at the end. So it's a really nice thing to see. So we, we, we wonder, everybody wonders, how can, in today where everybody's starving, how can the church afford to do a half a million dollar project or a million dollar project or six million dollar project? And believe it or not, on most of the projects we've recently finished, the priest has came to me and said that the membership has increased, the uh, number of people attending services has increased upon completion of the project. It really, it really does, uh, it does glorify the Lord through the decorating. So one thing that we started, I'm going to let this roll, a few years ago, because when I graduated from college in 1991, it would take at least five to ten years for a prospect to turn into a project. And so then I realized that, oh, look at the church in Louisville, uh, the cathedral. They did the Night of a Thousand Stars because they were selling stars on the ceiling. So they raised, you know, for a hundred dollars a star, you raise a hundred thousand um, dollars. So we started collecting all of the different fundraising literature that all the different churches were using. Now we're producing front fundraising literature as a you know, pro bono part of our service in order to help the projects go quicker. So instead of it taking five to ten years now, it usually takes one or two years. I mean, they're all, all custom. Uh, we make big fundraising boards. In this case, we did a large sample so that they could see what is it going to look like. Uh, that's at the Historical Society in Milwaukee. It's almost like someone just cleaned everything, but you know, we removed the drop ceiling here, put in the, the uh, took out the, all the holes in the ceiling, put in the new plaster, cleaned the skag columns, and then we make the big boards. We do the fundraising mailers. Um, also, for example, the cathedral in Savannah, Georgia, there's five, uh, Monsignor O'Neill ordered 40,000 leave behinds. So when the project was complete, there's a little bit of a timeline of the building, something, and there's something for them to mail in a check. You know, there's, there's the tear off. So the reason why we have that at the cathedral in Savannah is because my mother and father-in-law went to the cathedral in Savannah and asked the docent at the door who did the project, and they didn't know. So kind of hurt my feelings. So I made up this flyer, and I sent it down to Monsignor and said, do you want to buy some of these? And he said, yes. So, <laughs> so we, we, we do large churches, chapels. We're doing, you know, a, a three thousand dollar project right now, um, up to you know three million. Statue, um, prayer gardens, stained glass restoration, new stained glass. We break it down so people can buy a particular window for X amount of dollars, you know, get their name on it. It's different. So prior to doing the sample, it is important to do sometimes an investigative paint study. And what that entails is stripping back the paint in order to find out what was there. This is in uh, the administration building at Notre Dame under the Golden Dome. So we stripped back layer by layer by layer with surficants, different, uh, different strengths, to find out what was there and then we replicated it. Sometimes you would just strip back and you would conserve this, but they wanted it to look like Luigi Gregori originally intended. Um, we are fortunate enough to be working on St. Bernard, Bernard's Church in Watertown, Wisconsin, which 
uh, brother Adrian did. And starting probably this summer, I'm guessing, uh, we're going to be doing the sanctuary ceiling. We've d done the rendering and designed it with the historic decoration, but when we're up there, we will be doing the stripping so that we can be putting back his authentic work. It's just a good place to start. So one of the biggest and most valuable fundraising things that anybody can do to get a project off the ground is to do a fundraising sample. So we, we just decorate an area of the church. We normally wrap the scaffold with plastic so nobody can see what's going on there. And then we'll, we'll hang a couple of eye hooks up on the ceiling. And then at the right time, we'll have an event. Uh, Father will come in and, and ask the, the big donors to come in and, and have a, a big donation night. So drop, drop the large curtain and, and uh, keep our impressed. I don't know what happened with that one. This was a church in, or not a church, just a building in Cincinnati, and they let us do a small sample. Theater out in New York, stripped back and found their mural up there. The Orpheum Theater in Memphis, which we will be doing again in a few years. St. James in Louisville, I think some people have probably been there. We did that church in 1920 or so as well. <coughs> Stand stands in Cleveland. Where do I start? I'm going to stop it. It's the beginning of the end of the Renaissance because <laughs> the bishop comes in and says, "Well, oh, hold up. The focus group says there should be more Moav. And, and I, I think it's important to understand that the team, whether it's Conrad Schmidt or another company, the team that you're hiring is doing a lot of this type of project and they should um, not always have the person that does curtains for a living for houses be the person that's dictating the decorative scheme you know let 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 Mark Milley our, our rendering artist and let uh, you know Dave Andrews and Dave Fody and, and some of the other artists and, and the you know the, the staff at the studio get creative and, and have some fun with it and then we can peel it back from there or make adjustments but so how much do stained glass windows cost? Well, a, there's a good answer is it depends. You know, stained glass windows like this obviously are less than $100 a square foot. Um, stained glass windows like this are at least $1,200 a square foot. We're typically, for new stained glass windows today, they're probably ranging from 500 to 900 a square foot. So. Um, very nice Tiffany style windows though. Those those should be more like fifteen hundred. Is that rendered by how many characters you have or the it, particular structure that it's hanging in or something? Yeah, good question. It's it's the number of figures. Um, not so much in this one because in this one the only painted glass are the flesh tones. Okay, everything else is actually colored glass. But this is some drapery glass then this actually has multiple layers of glass. So this is called plated, it was Tiffany style. But in, in other more traditional windows we're doing today, you'll see, um, like at Sacred Heart, you'll see that the, the faces are painted, the, fle you know, the robes are painted, and it, it depends upon how many times you have to fire the face. Uh, that gives it more depth. It depends on um, the sizes of the pieces of glass and the quality of the glass. We can, we can get really cheap glass and, and cheap. yeah. <laughs> uh, what is Trompe painting? So you, you saw the Trompe painting at Notre Dame, but this is all painted to look like architecture. This is down at the uh, cathedral in Louisville, Cathedral of the Assumption. And that, I believe, is the oldest American stained glass window in this country that we restored. It's original, huh? Yep. And this is just the administration building where all of the Trump is on the inside if you go in there. Mm -hmm. This is a quick uh, uh, review of St. James in Louisville, sort of a, a project profile. This is what it looked like when we walked in there in 1995 or so. We, we went back, we found that in 1927 we had the contract and we found the old 
photograph that when we did it, and it was all full mosaic on the ceiling. You can see the eye in the middle, the gold leaf up here. Um, it was just gorgeous. So we started to strip back the original colors and um, to, the, to the original colors and see what's there. You can see stripping there, uh, the stripped area, and then the sample. And then this was the large sample that then raised the one and a half million dollars to do the project, plus probably another whatever it was for flooring and altars and things like that. So on here we've got multiple colors in glaze. So these are all glazed. They're base, they're they're primed. You know, it's washed, primed, base painted, and then glazed with one to two colors, and then highlight flashed. So we dry brush flash the tips to give them some high highlights. This isn't done yet. This is all just the start of the sample. We wouldn't leave the green on green like that. So this is a stencil where it's, it's base color, shadow color, stencil color, shadow color on the stencil, and highlights. So we probably got, I think, five to six colors. So five to six steps on a stencil like this. And it starts to get its trompe l'oeil effect. You can see it starts to come off. It's, you know, the, the bas relief. You know, we've actually got the shadow here, and we've got the highlight or the, the edge here, and the highlight coming down here. This is all flat. So there's, um, depending upon how many colors you add, depends, it affects the cost. Same with this. I mean, you can blow these out in one color and just paint, or is it prime paint and glaze, prime paint, glaze, and gild, or prime paint, paint glaze, and four different colors of uh, finished colors, highlights, shadows, glazes. There was the fundraising literature, meeting with the client, and the wow. scaffold. Man. There's a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of steel in there for, for uh, I think we were in there for 18 weeks. Wow. And a lot of times the church will say, we want to keep the church open. And it's like, well, <laughs> your price goes from 200,000 to 300 then because you, you, can't, you can't effectively work in a small area. I mean, when we're priming, we're priming the whole ceiling and then the crew goes right down the walls while the other guys are coming behind painting the ceiling. So we're, we're, there's some people that'll go in there and, and work off of lifts or work off of uh, small towers or, or ladders, but you can't get the quality that you're getting out of this. This is, this is the best way to do it. It has the best results in the short term and the best results in the long term for not only the company and the church, but the congregation and the, the Catholic Church as a whole. <coughs> Don't step there. <laughs> That's the ceiling getting its gold leaf. The eyeball. The eyeball. Does that include the book? <laughs> I think that one's not, uh, not quite. We had, we had a guy, one of our artists was at the top of the Basilica in Milwaukee, that church I showed you, the very large dome, and he was done gilding, scaffolding was coming down, he gilded the cross and the ball up there, and the newspaper came up and said, oh, get back up there and let me take your picture. So he's up there standing on the corner of the scaffold, reaching out, pretending like he's gilding, gets the front cover of the Milwaukee Journal, OSHA was at the door the next day. Yeah, writing tickets. <laughs> you can't make people think that it's okay for you to do that. So here's the before and here's the after. So it's just a, an amazing transformation. Uh, no, this one is St. James in Louisville. But they, they received pricing for the stations, you know, cleaning the windows and, and every line item. I mean, if you wanted faux marble on here and this faux stone on the walls, this stencil being this many colors or less colors, uh, gold leaf on the lettering going around, it was a major report and shopping list. That's Mm, 
depends. If they don't get it. If you have money, then then we will. Okay. Otherwise, it, other, otherwise we'll add it to the project in the yeah. back end. You know, some people can can pay as we go. Some people need us to co-invest, and we do that on a lot of projects. But you know, we used to do renderings all the time for free. You know, probably have four to six thousand dollars invested in each rendering, and. Uh, Nowadays, most people are paying for them up front. It, it gives them a little bit more sense of ownership. They, they want to do the project. I think it helps motivate the project. Just real quick, two seconds. I know Michael and, is it Kevin? Or, yeah, they're going to be touching base on Sacred Heart. But I just have a couple of quick pictures of you know, the, the damage. And then this was a realistic uh, we went back to exactly what was there. There was no, no adjusting. Mm. So we did the murals in the shop and that was all, the, the entire ceiling was painted with a calcimine paint. So as the firemen put out the fire, all of the humidity went up and all of the paint just drizzled off because it was just calcimine, it's like a chalk-based paint. Well, I've got a little series here on a gentleman named Bud Holterhaus. He retired this year and we just put together a book for him. He's the brother we were of our company that just retired this year. So I'm just doing a, a parallel to him. You know, he's, he's done projects in, in state capitals and uh, cathedrals and churches all over the entire country. And my sister put together a book. He's, he's even got gold leaf on his neck and his hair right there and <laughs> under his eyes, you know. But he lived on the road for 40 years of his life. And boy, did I not want him to retire. He put the gold on um, right over here on the landmarks, domes. Yep, he, he was up there. He did the interior there. That, I think that shot might, no, that could be inside the landmarks. No, it doesn't look like it, though. But... Um, you know, he became good friends with the cooks, and, and uh, he just said, Gunner, 40 years, I, I need to take some time and be home. You know, I mean, it started to get to the point where I'd lay him off a little bit, and he'd be like, you know what, this is kind of nice. Uh, I believe that's Notre Dame, but, but building that. There's us with the cooks over at Indiana Landmarks. That was a, a bud project, and we were doing samples. Gail is, is still a good friend. We're, we're doing the dome at uh, Indiana U up at Terre Haute for her right now. Well, for the state or for, but I think she funded a good portion of it. Yep, this was West Baden. You can see the uh, stencils. These were all done at the shop. Uh, there's actually the, the statues up here. Those were done on canvas at the shop and then all the painting and decorating. That's the, uh, where is that theater? I'll think of it in a little bit. Oh, Chicago, the Oriental Theater, the Cadillac. You guys might recognize this one. This was one of my projects. This is in Lafayette, Saint uh, Cathedral of Saint Mary, in Lafayette. Nice. All right, good. You remember when it was green and pink? Do you like it better or no? Oh, good. <laughs> I really, I, I really like this scheme. I wish I had a before of this, but um, this really turned out nice. And and you know what, what they did with the marble and, and the altars and everything is incredible. That was, a, that was a bud project. Little theater in, in uh, Lenzig Theater in Santa Fe. Milwaukee's Cathedral. We just did the decorating. We weren't part of the, the Vatican scandal there. I don't know if everybody read about that. This is Holy Hill in Hubertus, Wisconsin. This is all faux stone. This is faux stone, faux marble, and faux mosaic. Faux stone here. This is real stone right here. A mason walked in and said to Father Cyril, where did you find these exotic stones? These are amazing. They're all fake. <laughs> so we fooled the mason, so that was pretty good. This is all, all painted to look like stone. Can you share some personnel organizational information with us? In other words, do you have people on site that stay for a while? 
Well, we have two major departments, a glass and shop department, which glass and, 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 and um, art, murals, statuary, and everything, basically in shop. So we have about 27, 28 people in that department right now, four or five reps, um, we call them national project directors, and my sister, myself, and uh, support staff. Then on the road, we have a decorating department for projects like this, and there's probably 18 people in that department. They live all over the country, and, but they're full-time employees of Conrad Schmidt. Their majority are union, the in-house shop is non-union, um, but they will go to the project, I'll assign the foreman. You know, every Monday, the, the project directors and, and, and two or three more of us get together and have a scheduling meeting. So we have, right now we have eight decorating projects going on. We'll go through the, the decorating schedule and we'll go through who's where, who needs what. Rick will say, I need an artist for two weeks. So I'll pull the artist from this project, put him over there for two weeks. He'll go and, he'll go and take care of this wall. Okay, then he, he's not needed there because there's some downtime, so then he'll go to the next project. But these, th there's, there's a lot of people right now that live on the road full time. Some of them have mobile homes, um, you know, and things like that. We just pay them room and board. You know, they, we, we had it where they were uh, staying at the rectory or, or what have you to try to save money, but it ends up that it didn't save any money because they, the project would be done and they'd be still there painting the stations of the cross that were taken out of our contract and, <laughs> and painting this and, and doing the nativity set and what have you. So we, we, we changed that and said, okay, you're just always getting room and board. These are some of Bud's projects. This is in, um, this is the church in uh, Natchez, Mississippi, the Basilica. State Capitol in Iowa. I'm not sure. He did that. See, this is the, uh, the cathedral in Springfield. This is a piece of canvas that was painted at the studio. And so we painted, I think, 248 of those and then put them up on the ceiling. But you can see the amount of gold leaf that was used in here. <clears throat> yeah, there's the gold is still all falling. Well, you can see it laying around down here. French Lick. We did the murals at the studio again, brought them down and, and hung them. That was Bud's project, St. James. Uh, this is St. John Newman in Knoxville. New church, traditional in style. Just not, you know, if I had my way, this would have decoration up in the hood here. It would have some decoration in here, you know, something more traditional. It's a little dark, though, when you're doing something. Yeah, it's not really that dark, I don't think. This is the cathedral in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. You know, this, this has... I think three different color glazes on it. Same with this. This is all full painted. And you know, it's South Dakota, so when you do marbleizing, you don't do marbleizing with you know, turkey feathers or anything like that. We used pheasant wings. <laughs> you know, you got to use the pheasants out there. So you can smell the gunpowder when you get off the plane. And this is the finished product of uh, St. Peter's in Omaha, which I showed you some of the renderings for. We got all of the full marble, and it is, you can walk up to it and you would believe that this is true marble today. It, it turned out phenomenal. That was the 20 years. So, we want, What's happening today, I mean, in, in reality, one of, the, one of my major things that I'm doing today, besides running Conrad Schmidt Studios and trying to keep the doors open every day, and I mean, the last 10 years was horrendous for a company that sells gold leaf in churches. Um, so we had a lot of time to think and sharpen the pencil and, and just do anything we could to stay, stay afloat. 
one of the things that we're, we've just got, about got done is a new website called churchtrader.com. And it's kind of like the Auto Trader or CarMax or Boat Trader, where you can scroll and you can look for altars. We're always having people call us and say, where, where can I get an altar, a used altar? Well, you can call these 16 different people and go on their 16 different websites. Now you're going to be able to have those people put their products right on one site. So if a church is looking for a statue, if the, I had someone call yesterday and said, I want to sell my stained glass windows. I said, well, do you want to put them on consignment and pay somebody uh, half of what you're going to get? You know, um, you know but, but now you'll be able to list. And we've got it set up where when you list it, the archdiocese can choose who can see it. Because, for example, Chicago, they can't sell their products. So their products will go onto the website where it's simply within their diocese and there's not, you know, for sale. They're kind of more of a sharing market, a trading market. So you can list it for professionals, for general public. You can list it for architects, um, things like that. So this will be a really wonderful site. It should be kicking off. I mean, it's already up and functional but you guys can't find it yet. I mean, we're just trying to load it up. Um, and I've got to finalize some of the, the pricing down here. I just, I don't, I, I feel like it shouldn't be charging anything, but you have to charge something in order to be able to run it. So we don't know what the costs to run it are yet. And then I get free ads. <laughs> the next thing we're working on is a book right now called Cathedral Caretakers. It's the complete guide for the care of our houses of worship. So it's the A to Z. We start with attic. We, we go to basement. You know, I mean, it's every single item. You'd be surprised that, um, and, and uh, I want to give a presentation and a book to every single graduating seminarian because sometimes uh, they might not be aware that prior to painting the interior, we need to make sure we fix the roof, the flashing, the gutters, and the, the, you know, the tuck pointing and everything. So we've got to start in that direction. And this book is it's 95% done. I think Liturgical Training Publications is going to be the publisher out of Chicago. We've met with them. Um, it, it's getting there. Um, so it's, it's real close. I don't know if it'll have that title because if they're going to publish it, they don't necessarily want that title, they've told me. And the last thing that I have is a stained glass valuation guide. Um, we started out by doing a, um, like a guide on our website that you can look at, you take the pictures of your windows, you take details, you take sizes, you do a little floor plan, you send it to us, and we give you a price of what your, your thing's worth but it's developed more into what I call, it's churchassets.com. So it's, it's um, we will go in there or you will go in there and you will import all of this stuff into a website, push a button, we'll give you the value of everything for replacement cost. You'll, you'll send the password to your insurance company, make sure that you have everything and it's all locked up in a sort of a little vault on the, on the website and you have everything you know you have documentation of all of your assets your your chalices your your windows everything like that so i've burned up 52 minutes and i was supposed to talk for an hour and a half so i thank you um any questions <laughs> i i do have another series of before and afters that i can let go Hopefully it'll run while you, if anybody's asking any questions or you guys can just look at it. How yeah. do you manage Oops. The, Go ahead. Go ahead. How do you manage the tree work that is getting roof fixed and all that? Do you trust that or is that necessary? Um, you know, we do, we act as a construction manager sometimes, you know, so maybe a 6% fee to, to coordinate other trades. Sometimes we're acting as a general contractor. Generally not on the exterior work though. I see a conflict of interest if I'm, I don't know, maybe it's not called a conflict of interest, but for, for us to be fixing the outside and then there's a leak and, and I fixed the outside, but there's a leak a year and a half later and now I've got to repair it, but now I've got to point the finger at the guy that did that. You know, it's, it kind of seems weird. So 
we generally come in after the building envelope has been taken care of. Uh, you mentioned, you showed a lot of slides where they would do a sample and invite the big donors in. So it strikes me that once you do that, I mean, the die is cast. They pretty much have to go ahead with the project, don't they? Yep. Have you ever yep. had one where they... I have had one where the project did not go through. That is in Lowell, Massachusetts. I think it's St. Patrick's. And I think the, uh, I, I don't know the exact particulars of it. I think the priest was pulled out and moved someplace else. I think the project, you know, there's, there's certain priests that are project doers and there's certain ones that don't want, ever want to do a project. You know, one, one's dad was a builder and he loves it and that's what he wants to do. Other ones, they, they don't have any, any desire at all. So I don't know if that project will ever take place. Um, I don't think it's the Brother Adrian Church. I think the Brother Adrian Church in, there, in uh, Lowell, was that Immaculate Conception? I'm not sure. But there's, there's another, I think there's one in Lowell that he did. Um, so yeah, the, the samples generally are after you're committed. You know, you have to be committed. I mean, we can, we can paint it back out. Well, so in that situation in Lowell, did you have to go back and undo what you'd done? Uh, it's still up there, hoping that uh, someone comes through with the big check. You know, I mean, they haven't asked us to come back and do anything. Kind of a big county town, but you know, not a. The pastor asked for restoration money. He got two million in less than a year. Yeah. So I mean, there's you'd be surprised where you can find the money. Yeah, and and uh, I mean, I, I agree that it's it's the money's there. It's just still in everybody's pockets. You know, I mean, that's the the truth. It it, it uh, there's. Uh, there's a church that you know one person was going to give seven million dollars for one project and I mean obviously it, we don't have the endowment that some places have but uh, we, we, we do if, if you ask it, you usually can get it you know yes sir uh, is this the Catholic version of your show uh, I didn't see any do Protestants use your service? Yeah, they do. <laughs> this is uh, because because I I figured that I guess I may have incorrectly assumed, but I assumed that Adrian we were did predominantly Catholic churches. Okay, so I kind of tried to focus on that. You know, we're we're doing uh, SMU, uh, the Methodist. Uh, we did Perkins Chapel down there. We've done just this summer. We did. Um, their, uh, the uh, McFarland Auditorium on campus. Uh, we're doing a Lutheran churches, uh, Presbyterian churches, stained glass restoration. Um, predominantly though, we're probably 85% Catholic churches, um, give or take. You know, like next year I'll have a couple of million dollars at the state capitol in, in Minnesota. So that'll be a big project. We just finished the state capitol in South Dakota, or North Dakota, um, all of the stained glass restoration there. So it, it comes and goes. Independent Presbyterian down in um, Birmingham, Alabama, we did all of that. So th there are, but I did, I did give, the, give you the Catholic version here. Yes, sir. On the Catholic churches, you made a comment about your, so your workers staying at the thing. I know how the add-ons and the extras and all the other get started. How do you control these? priests, bishops, and whatever, who think, oh, I can go in there and tell them to do this or change things. How do you keep them away to, without injuring the project, but, you know, and right. a, a sour face on your company, but, you know, you don't like to be disrespectful, but just because you're the bishop or you're the priest or you're the person in charge of this, you know, we, we need to get the work done. And yeah. they've got your guys dragging them over here doing like that, that happens once in a while. It, it's, a signed yeah, we do have a signed, I mean, we have a very clear contract based on the renderings. We come in and we'll have a meeting. I'll go, I'll go to, I, I was in, 
for example, uh, Dallas, every Wednesday for 12 weeks. Every Wednesday we got together with the architect, the owner, and, and uh, you know, we reviewed samples. Gave the guys enough work to do for the next couple of weeks, but we came back the next week, went over everything. We, we get together as a group. If we know that it's the kind of project where a priest or a member of the church consistently is coming back in after the meeting and telling my foreman to do something differently, we address that. You know, we just, we, we have to, I mean, our, our guy will just say, you know, our, our foreman knows who he's working for. You know, I mean, he knows that we're writing the check. I know it's coming from the priest, but we can't do things twice. Otherwise, we get an overrun. And the last thing that anybody wants on a project is a, a bill for an extra. And we don't bill extras. We request change orders if it's something that is obviously to be requested. You know, like the statues weren't in the contract and we want all the statues polychromed. Yes? Yep, yep. I Okay. I, I didn't. I, I just uh, I just showed a slide of it. These are just before and after shots, and this is a project that Bud Holterhouse, who, who retired this year, was was on, and I just basically mentioned that. You know. Yeah, and, and they don't know something like this. If, if you look at this stencil, we, we probably put up four or six variations of that stencil. And when you do this stencil, the distance from here to here is different from here to here. This is different from here to here than it is from here to here. So you're, you're not just replicating a stencil and rolling this on. And as you're getting to the end, those last six have to grow a half inch a piece. And then this one's growing two inches. And, and everything in order for them to remain, I mean, because we do, in, in Catholic Church decorating, symmetry is very important. So, so we do a lot of symmetry. So it's, people go, ah, we can get someone to stencil that. Well, yeah, you can. I mean, we can, we can stencil it too, but we don't want to put our name on it, you know, I mean. It, so, yeah, neat project. Um, yeah, I was there a lot of times. And, and Father Dan Gartland, I think, was there. And then he moved to St. Lawrence, and right in the middle of the recession, we had you know, 25 people in our glass department, zero work, no work. So I called, he called up and said, we'd like to look at getting our stained glass restored. I told him, I'll do that window. It's typically $250 a square foot to relet it. I'll do it for 100 and a quarter a square foot for that window, just to, just to get my foot in the door to see how much it's gonna take. He calls me up the next day. We want to do the whole side of the church for that price. <laughs> he got the best deal in the world, but I kept the employees working. You know, but boy, did he get a deal. <laughs> Someone had their hand. Yes? Are you pleased at your 
emphasis on decorating the walls with murals and with stencils because we have seen a lot of country churches mostly and so often people try to restore the church and the only thing that looks wrong is the blank walls and now um, we have talked about this vaguely at my church um, and we have been told that trying to find the old decorations under the current paint is a very, very expensive process. Is that correct? Not really. Um, <laughs> Eileen Grogan uh, is in our office. She's a, our preservation specialist. And she, we don't even really, if you want to go and, and find out what's under there, I mean, let's pay her time. You know, I, I've got to pay her time, but you know, let's go back and see what's under there. If you think you want to see what's under there, we would come out there. It's probably going to cost us a few thousand dollars. We'll do some stripping in certain areas, see how easily it strips back, get an idea, produce a rendering, and see if you can raise the funds. You know, so so to to strip back and see what's there. Yes, if we're going to strip the whole church, but if we can find some historic photos and deal with the uh, the areas. Yep. Okay, I think, uh, you know, the majority of um, decorations from back then are usually washed off because they were in calcimine. So, so it's, it's possible that they might not exist or just traces of them exist. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> first I want to make a quick comment. The gentleman mentioned uh, how people are impressed when they come in the Saints, uh, or I'm sorry, that, that uh, uh, cathedral in Lafayette. Uh, my sister used to give tours of Sacred Heart uh, where we're parishioners uh, and after the restoration she had some high school kids in and one of the one of the kids walked in looked around and said we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, but I wondered one thing about your staff uh, what kind of longevity there is and uh, well surprised that some are union and some aren't. Is well that a very problem? you know the some people don't want union. Uh, some of the artists will not join the union because they're artists. Um, some cities were required to be union. Some cities they don't even want the union there. Um, so we, we've got kind of a you know, and, and anybody who really travels is predominantly union, the predominantly. Um, but the longevity is excellent. I mean, we we we're you know, if if someone leaves because I lay them off because we don't have a project and they go work for somebody else they come back, guaranteed, because they, they, they love the fact that we are, they, they call us the Marines of the decorative arts you know, industry as compared to the Walmart of the decorative arts. So we, we're not going to, you know, we're not, they, they know that we're going to walk away with something that we can be really proud of, even if you have a Zoom camera, you know. So they're, they're you know, Bud's been with us, I think, 20 years, and he came from another company. Um, you know, we've had a guy that retired after 46 years recently. Uh, they're, they're, they're sticking around. But thank you, and uh, thank you. Well, thank you, you, Mike. Thank you very much.